we thought it appropriate and fitting in the lead up to World Environment Day and on the back of a historic election that, where climate and biodiversity were front and centre, that we would gather in one room, Cassinia's friends and stakeholders, people dedicated to and impacted by nature to launch Woodlands. Now, before we do any kind of big reveal, it's important that we set the context. And to do so, I'd like to invite to the stage three subject matter experts who have agreed to answer some hard-hitting questions. Uh, the first one's already there, <laughs> Paul Detman, and he needs no introduction, but sixth generation farmer, CEO of Cassinia and founder of Woodlands. We have Jane Hutchinson. Come on up, Jane. Grab yourself a stool and a microphone. Everyone give it up for Jane. Co-CEO of Pollination Foundation and former CEO of the Tasmania Land Conservancy and Executive Director of Strategy and Innovation at the Nature Conservancy. And Chris Lindorf, an experienced and celebrated ecologist with 18 years experience at Trust for Nature. Now, unfortunately, Chris has uh, come down with something and so he'll be joining us via video. Um, but his contribution is uh, gratefully received. So, uh, let's get to some of those questions. Now, once again, feel free to come forward, grab a seat if you're feeling a bit uncomfortable. I'm gonna start with you, Paul. As we approach World Environment Day, why is biodiversity an issue we're discussing? I had, this is a question with notice, so I had some time to think about my uh, answer, but I think there's three reasons why it's critical that we we sit here and we come together and we really think about biodiversity independent of some of the other um, environmental issues that that seem to fo you know be the focus of our, our conversation, our thought. Um, about ten years ago, the Stockholm Institute brought forward a concept called the nine planetary boundaries, and they sort of articulated that there's there's nine types of um, planetary, uh, well, boundaries, planetary um, boundaries that we live within that are essential for, for life on Earth. And um, of those nine planetary boundaries, um, they sort of put a threshold above which, you know, crossing them would be very dangerous. Um, and it's interesting that climate change is one of the boundaries that we haven't yet crossed. We're on the way to crossing, but they, they said we haven't yet crossed. But the two that we have crossed... Um, substantially are biodiversity loss and nutrient flows, phosphorus and nitrogen flows. And it's interesting that there's a whole lot of regulation now around phosphorus and nitrogen, particularly in, in more densely populated areas, particularly in Europe, and there's trading systems around phosphorus and nitrogen, but there's nothing that specifically addresses um, biodiversity loss. And so we've felt for a long time that you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of initiatives, there's a lot of programs, a lot of people doing something, but there's no standardised approach to say how we how we going, how we getting there, and how can we invest in this solution to this problem. So that's the first one. Second second one, and and this is a little bit controversial to say it, but um, but I really feel that it's the truth that climate change is sort of the the focus of huge amounts of capital and and human intellect and and um, human capacity, and rightly so. Um, it's a problem that we're trying to address and we are addressing, but I feel like at least theoretically climate change is reversible, um, whereas there's not even a theoretical version of, of extinction that's, that's reversible. And biodiversity loss, you know, encum encompassing myriads of species is just another form of that. So that's not even theoretically reversible. So I think that's, I think it should be our number one environmental problem that we're looking at. And thirdly, and really linked to those two, is um, we've got this UN Convention on Biological Diversity, but there's no way that, 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 that individuals and businesses and even large business can, can engage in a transparent, um, clear, objective, standardised approach to realising that 30% goal. And so obviously Woodlands is one shot at that um, and we recognise that this is going to be a big program with a lot of other people working together on it. But that's, that's yeah, that's the other, the third reason why I think this is a, a really important thing to focus on. Thanks, Paul. Jane, 
So what are the boardroom conversations taking place around these issues and how are you seeing the narrative change in the corporate world? Great question. Um, so what we're seeing in the boardrooms is really, um, I guess, framed by a larger conversation that's been happening internationally that started off with um, conservation communities like a lot of us in the room, all sounding warning bells around what's happening with biodiversity loss and Paul's just talked about planetary boundaries. We've been talking about it for a long time between us, um, but it matters less who says it, sorry, matters less what is said than who says it. And so about in about 2020, um, we started seeing some finance sector actors starting to talk about biodiversity loss. And that's really significant because they started to talk about it in a financial context. So it started with organisations like the World Economic Forum that said, you know, that um, half of the world's uh, GDP is dependent on nature and then moved to the Gastupta review, review from the UK Treasury that said, you know, we've got a problem because we're impacting on nature and we need to do something about it because it's a financial problem, not just a problem for biodiversity. So that then led to boardroom conversations around, wow, okay, so this is a financial impact, it's an impact for our businesses, and so we need to do something about it. So what, how that's now playing out in the boardrooms of Australia and internationally is companies are starting to make commitments in relation to nature loss and biodiversity in particular. They're starting to talk about it in the context not just of carbon, which is where it started to kind of appear about five years ago. Companies started to say, we've got this problem with carbon. They started to set targets and started to do something about it. Then the world started to talk about these linked or twin challenges of climate, um, climate impact and nature loss. And that led now, is leading now to the setting of targets in relation to nature in and of itself. So what we're seeing is target setting in relation to impact and dependency on nature. And then what we need to do about it is the next step in that um, discussion. So I'll leave it there because there's some discussion later to be had about what those next steps ought to be. Thanks, Jane. Chris, <laughs> it'll be seamless, right? <laughs> right now, how is biodiversity protected and what role can Wildlands play? Thanks, Ash. I'm sorry I can't be with you and your guests in person today. The primary threat to most biodiversity is habitat loss and therefore it stands that our primary response to biodiversity loss be the protection of habitat, especially those habitats under most pressure from urban and industrial development, mining, agriculture and other uses. The foundation of biodiversity conservation is our network of protected areas across the globe, from our great national parks to protected areas on private land that are achieved through conservation agreements under a wide range of conservation programs. In Australia, we are particularly familiar with conservation covenanting programs that are offered by state and federal jurisdictions under various legislation. In Victoria, there's Trust for Nature under the Victorian Conservation Trust Act. In New South Wales, Biodiversity Conservation Trust under the Nature Conservation Trust Act. In South Australia, Heritage Agreement Program under the Native Vegetation Act and there are many others in other states. Wilderlands recognises the importance of safeguarding Australia's natural habitat from further losses and for that reason all new Wilderlands projects will include conservation covenant protection of the land, contributing to the nat national reserve system and adding to the global conservation target of 30% by 2030 under the Convention on Biological Diversity. The role of Wilderlands is to offer a very tangible product for the customer in the form of adding more private habitat to the protected area network and enhancing the quality of habitat through strategic pest plant and animal control, threatened species management, revegetation and other restoration works. Secondly, and significantly, Wilderlands maintains close communication with its supporters who will be able to track the progress of conservation work across their funded Wilderlands projects. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> Paul, you're a sixth generation farmer, landholder and the visionary behind Wilderlands. 
What's your big vision for this platform? Thanks, Ash. Um, I feel like, again, I've got three points to, to bring into this. Um, the first one uh, I'd say, and it's great to have so many of my friends here who represent so many different conservation organisations. Um, uh, and I feel like I may have done a, a bit of an injustice to everyone by saying like, this is the first. Of course, a lot of us have been working on a lot of things for a long time, you know, decades. Not like this is the first time anyone's thought about biodiversity protection. Um, there really is, I've got the natural temptation and, and, and um, the natural sort of competition to go, you know, the thing that I do, I'd love it to be good. You know, I'd love it to be successful. I'd love it to really work. Um, but I'm absolutely convinced that this problem and the way we go about solving it can only be solved together. And um, so I guess in terms of a definition of success on what Wilderlands might actually achieve, um, I reckon we, I, uh, one of the things that I really hope that it achieves is, is it brings us together onto the, onto the same journey. Now, we've talked about the fact that um, there's a four Cassinia properties. They're going to be the initial sort of pilot project on the Woodlands platform. But it's a platform. It's not a – it's a separate company to Cassinia. Um, Cassinia will bring the first four projects to it as we work out the bugs. But we would love to see this to be an enabler of work that Bush Heritage is doing or Trust for Nature is doing or AWC is doing or – you know, whoever else um, is in the landscape doing this stuff, that it would be able to be facilitated by this platform. And not only that, that, that this, uh, this platform would be a great learning for us all to work together to see how we can find better ways and more transparent ways and more engaging ways to, to meet those goals of the, of the bio Convention on Biological Diversity. So I think the first point is I would really hope that we can land something that's very collaborative here. Um, the second point, I think, I, what I'd love to see to come out of this, and, and this is one we'd all share, um, there's 77 million hectares of Australia that need to be protected for nature for us to reach even the simplest form of our 2030 goal. And I really hope that, that the Wilderlands platform will offer farmers, will offer traditional owners, will offer the whole community an opportunity um, and the resources and the imprimatur, really, to con to consider um, the role of nature in an integrated agricultural landscape. So, you know, if we can get this right and if this thing can be successful, it will open up an opportunity for, for nature to be thought of in a different way. And finally, um, yeah, I hope, I hope that this uh, brings a bit of a new way of thinking about the way we think about landscapes. Um, as I mentioned before, I've worked at World Vision, I worked in Africa and um, worked with communities that were very much living hand to mouth. And it's not really possible to have a big vision of the future when you're busy trying to stay alive in the present. Um, but I hope this project can um, find a way for us to put a value on all species, um, can put a, a, way of, um, a, a way of really tangibly um, connecting with that uh, with that wonder and that 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 connection we feel with nature I believe it's a divine connection and I, and I thank God for it but I also th think that the inherent value that nature embodies um, should be recognized as um, Pablo said in the in the video before it's it's those intangibles that that we just take for granted and it would be great if they became more tangible and, and communities could see landscapes where nature was genuinely valued. I was on a Zoom call recently with, um, with somebody in Melbourne and, and, and that, that idea of valuing nature came up in a negative light. Um, he said, there's some things I, I just don't think we should put a price on. We shouldn't put a price on marriage. We shouldn't put a price on paying somebody to be married to us. And I don't think we should put a price on nature. And I didn't have the chance to have the chat to him, but, but I feel like the opposite is actually true when it comes to nature. By not putting a value on it. We effectively value it at, at nothing. And this this is an opportunity to, to place a value on on something that communities can care for, that they can be paid to care for, that that really does embed nature in the economy in ways that, that genuinely values what it contributes. There you go, that's a long answer. Sorry, I went a Thanks, bit ad lib. Thanks.
Jane, we know the desire for organisations is to do good and to be seen doing good. How might Wildlands enable that impact? Um, another good question. I'm going to start by not answering the question and taking everyone back to the boardrooms of companies and corporates and financial organisations that can mobilise trillions of dollars to invest in nature and answer the question by saying integrity is absolutely critical to that investment. Without integrity, they are not going to invest. And the other point to make about that is it's really important for products like this, when they come onto the market, for integrity to lead out, to take you know, a step forward. Um, because as we saw with the carbon market, when you have greenwashing and where there are products out there that don't have integrity, it sets the market backwards. And that's the last thing we need for nature because we've got no time to lose. So what is happening now is that there's a mobilisation around a thing called Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosures. That's a really big mouthful, but what it's aiming to achieve is help companies understand what their impacts on nature are and, importantly, what their dependencies on nature are. So their companies are starting to think about and the financial sector is starting to think about what are their impacts and what are their dependencies on nature, knowing that half the world's GDP is dependent on nature. What that then means is once they've done that exercise, they're going to either have to change their practice and mitigate, avoid or mitigate their impact, or they're going to have to invest. And so that then brings us back to projects like Wilderlands high integrity projects that are investable by the financial sector and by companies at scale, because that's the kind of money we need to move in order to solve the challenges that we face. So I've drunk the Kool-Aid, clearly because I'm wearing the T-shirt. <laughs> so a um, lot of people. <laughs> well, when you give them out for free, that's the inevitable conclusion. Um, and they're great colours too, by the way, good choice. So what I would just leave you with is integrity is critical for the market and the Wilderlands project has integrity, not only because of the mechanisms that sit behind it, but also obviously because of the people that have generated it. Thanks, Jane. And to finish up, uh, Chris, <laughs> the question on everyone's mind then is where is the rigour behind this? What's the methodology or framework Wilderlands is built on? To begin answering that question, I might start with the name Paul Deckman. Paul's proven himself to be an extraordinary environmental entrepreneur, courageous, visionary and successful in founding world. I didn't tell him to say Paul this. Paul has understood the fundamental need he's to just got a, bonus. a voluntary biodiversity marketplace and he's brought together the best team to develop a program that we can all be confident in. In particular, Nick Lewis, founder of Vegetation Link, with a very thorough understanding of the Vegetation Offset Compliance Register and how a voluntary biodiversity unit may also operate on a register. At the nuts and bolts ecological level, each Wilderlands project is backed by a scientifically developed conservation management plan, written, reviewed and endorsed by expert ecologists and endorsed by the governing covenanting body. First baseline surveying and then regular monitoring over the life of the project ensures adequate and informative feedback is obtained to track gains in habitat structure and quality and threatened species survival. Needless to say, a robust management plan will be a pivotal document to each Wilderlands project. However, Wilderlands wishes to be judged on the quality of the projects being offered to customers and not just the quantity of money spent in land management. For this reason, Wilderlands has developed eligibility criteria for assessing future prospective projects. Criteria includes status of ecological significance, presence of valued ecological attributes, presence of threatened species, landscape context, opportunities for connecting existing vegetation, cultural values and potential partnerships with traditional owners. The essential Wilderlands document that brings all the relevant program information together is the Wilderlands White Paper. It highlights the features of Wilderlands that seek to solve the problem of biodiversity loss. I commend this White Paper to your readership. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks again, Paul and Jane. Um, Thank you. Really appreciate your input this afternoon.